Hello Heartbeaters and welcome to episode 9 of the Heartbeat Podcast. I'm your host, Yokani Oliveira. And with this episode, we'll be discussing COVID-19 and pulmonology. Pulmonology is the study of the respiratory system. So we'll be speaking to a lung specialist. Stay tuned for more. We are joined today by Dr. Willy Brewer. Am I pronouncing it correctly, doctor? Yes. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Dr. Brewer was recently um, diagnosed with COVID-19, but what's interesting in his case is that he is a lung specialist or pulmonologist um, by profession. So doctor, can you basically just run us down through how many, how many years have you been practicing as a, as a doctor in this uh, specialty and you know, what you do? Yeah. Sure, I, I, um, I qualified as a specialist physician in, in 2012 um, and then did uh, pulmonology training for another two years. So I qualified as a, uh, a pulmonologist in, at the end of 2014. And then I came back to Namibia. I'm a Namibian, born here, but I did all my training in South Africa. So I've been practicing in Namibia since end of 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so taking us through your COVID journey as an individual, how and when did you contract COVID-19? How, how did that happen? Yeah. So I, um, on the, on, I, I was tested on the 11th of, um, of August. The reason why I tested was that some of my colleagues actually tested positive. Um, they went for the test the month. Well, I heard their result. Well, the, the, they tested positive on the Monday. I heard the results on the Tuesday. Mm. And then at that stage, I just thought it's, it's better to um, do the test. So we um, then tested the Tuesday afternoon, uh, Tuesday morning, and I got the results late, late afternoon um, positive. At that stage, I was totally asymptomatic. So it was quite a shock. I didn't expect it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And, and did you develop any symptoms thereafter or were you completely fine? Yeah. So in, in retrospect, actually the Sunday before I had quite severe headaches, which um, it seems is actually a common occurrence in COVID. Yeah. At the time, I didn't make much much about much of it. Um, I thought it's just a normal headache. I took a few paracetamols and, and it went away. And then on the Thursday um, following my test, I started having symptoms. Yeah. I was fortunate in that the symptoms weren't that severe. I basically had a, a tight chest, shortness of breath with, with minimal activity. I mean, getting out of bed, walking a few steps, I became tired. Yeah. Um, and I had a very low-grade fever. So, um, that lasted, uh, and, and I lost my smell, which is actually also quite common in, in um, COVID patients. Yeah. What I didn't lose is I didn't lose my taste, which, which was quite an interesting experience. Yeah. But... Um, Anyway, so I had symptoms then, the shortness of breath, basically from the Thursday till the Saturday. And by the Sunday, I started feeling better again. And pretty much by the Monday, I was totally asymptomatic again. So I, I was very fortunate. I mean, many patients have much worse symptoms, um, severe joint pains, muscle pains, fevers, those type of things, and even worse shortness of breath than I had. But yeah, uh, for a few days, I had symptoms. And since then... Fortunately, I've, I've recovered. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you, you did not experience uh, the, 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 the pressure on your chest or your lungs? At some yeah, well, well, yes. With the shortness of breath and, and the tight chested. So the, I, I basically on this, on this Thursday, I, I mean, then I felt sort of unwell. I mean, you, in retrospect, it probably wasn't that bad. But I, I mean, you had the tight chest and you felt like you can't breathe properly. And um, I did my, my saturations. Um, I actually regularly monitored my saturation from the time I was diagnosed and on the and pulse rate. And on that, that Thursday, the saturation started going down um, on my the, the finger saturation. And then my pulse rate, also my resting pulse rate went up. Mm -hmm. So when you could feel you're not, not, not well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, how, how have you, re so you've recovered now. It's, it's safe to say that you've recovered. Yes. Yeah. So I, I've, um, so that was on the 11th on the 20th. Uh, my first test was on the 11th on the 21st. 
as per um, government protocol, I went for a follow-up test and I actually was, I tested negative, which is a surprise because most people don't test negative on, on day 10. But, um, and because I was at that stage, sort of three days symptom free, that was a Friday, the following Monday, I was, I was cleared to, to come back to work. And at, at this stage, I'm totally, I mean, I fully recovered. Yeah, yeah. And so how did you how did you manage COVID? I don't know if you had a family at home and, and how you were coping with it. Did you isolate yourself in a certain room and how did you treat yourself? Yeah, I, I, yes. Um so from the when I when I got home on the on the Tuesday, even before I, I had the um the test results, I self isolated. So essentially um, again, as per, per the standard operating procedures, you have to have a, a bedroom and a bathroom which nobody else uses, and that's essentially what I did. So I basically locked myself into my into a bedroom with a um, ensuite bathroom, and that's where I stayed for the ten days. Um, it, I must say, it's it's quite an emotionally draining um, thing to be by yourself the whole time. Um, and it does get frustrating at times, but I, I decided because of my kids and I didn't, I, I mean, I knew they had contact with me beforehand. So there was obviously a possibility that they could be infected, but I didn't want to re-expose them. And, and if they didn't have, if they weren't infected before, then I would, I try to, to prevent infection with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and talking about um, just taking care of yourself in general, did you, have any home, you know, remedies to make yourself feel better? Yeah. Yes, I, um, I mean, I've, even before I had the COVID, I started taking um, vitamin C supplements and uh, vitamin D supplements as well as um, zinc um, supplements. Um, during the, the time that I was sick, um, I also took some um, anticoagulants, which there's not a lot of evidence for, but given that I had some risk factors, I decided it's probably safer for me to do it. In retrospect, I don't know if I if I would do it again, um, given the the sort of minimal symptoms that I had. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, those were the things that I took, and then obviously I had a home saturation monitor that that I, I frequently checked my saturations with to see at least how, how this. The, the blood oxygen levels are right right and and so from a pulmonologist's uh, perspective so medically speaking um can yes. you talk about how COVID-19 impacts the lungs um I don't know yes. if, yeah can you maybe just take no. that to us please so basically what, what, and it's important to realize that COVID has a spectrum of, of disease. So not everybody will get, get lung infection per se. Um, it is, but, but the patients who do develop lung infections, so most often it's an upper respiratory tract infection, so sore throat, blocked nose, as, as I mentioned, loss of smell, loss of taste. But in, in some cases, it does cause a, um, in, inflammation in the lungs or a pneumonic process. Mm -hmm. And essentially then what happens is you get, the, the lungs' ability to transfer oxygen from the air to the blood vessels gets, um, gets impaired, um, be it due to either fluid collecting in the, in the small um, air spaces of the lung or then even at some, in some cases clotting of the, the small blood vessels that, that should actually collect the, the oxygen in the blood in from the lungs so it's actually two things it's the one part the inflammation and then the second part the small blood clots that can develop in the yeah. lungs yeah and and so we we obviously people experience COVID-19 differently that's a given um and yeah. obviously you didn't go through the severe the severe uh, yes. uh the lung pressure or whatever yeah. you that. Yes. but um obviously from the less uh, severe cases, maybe people would want yeah. to know how do I, uh, how do I say, control my breathing or how do I better my breathing? Yeah. That I can't. Yeah. No, you know, I, I think that it's, it is actually quite important to focus on that. I, what, 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 what I find in, in, in the practice is we often, the, the patients who get bad complications, well, not all of them, but, we often find that patients really present late. Um, they and and with COVID, we we see it because we know that 
the disease has sort of a slow onset and then s s rapidly deteriorates. Okay, so over, a, question, over a, a few hours, you can actually become quite severely sick. Mm -hmm. what, we, what we found is if patients can look at, for instance, their blood pressure, their, their pulse rate and their breathing rate, and if they start realizing, listen, I've, I was able to walk easily, say, 10 steps, and now I'm, I'm breathing faster when I do that or mm -hmm. a short, short distance, that's the time where one should really um, get to a healthcare worker so that you can be assessed because that might be the, the initial sort of onset of this rapid deterioration. I mean, we don't want to wait until it's too late because then, then we're really struggling with sort of trying to catch up um, what we could have, could have possibly even prevented if we, if we saw the patient early enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, speaking from your experience as a health professional, how, how, are, how are health professionals like yourself uh, coping with patients that come in and out um, who have tested positive for COVID? Um, how has it been so far? Obviously, it's a bit traumatic because our health system isn't really used to this new thing, you know? So how's yeah. it going? It, I must say it is quite a challenge. I, I actually told my wife um, the other day, it's, it's the first time since I've practiced, and I mean, even as a qualifying as a general practitioner in 2003, I've never worked in a hospital where I've seen so many patients with the same diagnosis. I mean, I know in, in, in the public and in the social media, lots of people make comments that this is just a, a, a flu. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never, ever, ever seen a flu where I've admitted say 10 patients on the same day with the same diagnosis it just doesn't work like that and what this does is it it really puts strain on the on the health services because we i mean we re really at the beginning of this of the, the the local epidemic of this international pandemic but and and we can already see that the hospital beds are starting to fill up. I mean, we have to move patients frequently from one hospital to, uh, if we need admission, then suddenly we have to transfer to a different hospital. And and that is going to be a, a problem. Um, from a, a staffing perspective, I think the, the, the nursing staff and even the doctors are obviously scared of the disease. Um, it, it puts a, a massive emotional strain on them, um, which one would also have to try and manage. I'm fortunate that I'm now over the disease and, and one presumes I, I would have some form of immunity. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a bit easier to work with the patients than it was definitely before I got sick. I'm, I'm less scared of the disease, if one wants to call it that. But one, the healthcare system is definitely under strain at this stage and we should, should try our best to, to mitigate the effects that, that this disease has on the healthcare system. Right. And so you mentioned immunity. Um, it's obviously, Re, a reinfection is possible. We know this, um, but yeah. maybe from a, again from a, a medical perspective, um, yeah. you know, how does so, infection affect a weaker lung than it would somebody who isn't so much at risk? You know, like in yeah. general. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a few um, parts to this the, the question. So the first um, question is is with regards to risk factors. Now I think that um, there are certain risk factors that makes you at higher risk um, and one would have to monitor those type of patients closer than one would have possibly persons with lower risk factors. Higher risk factors include things like uh, diabetes, um, chronic uh, lung diseases, for instance, emphysema mm -hmm. or previous structural lung diseases, people who had previous tuberculosis, for instance, with lung destruction, those type of diseases. Then we get patients with chronic um, heart disease being at risk, um, cancers being a, being a risk factor, and then also patients who's overweight. Um, we, we are actually recently, we've actually recently learned that um, um, your body weight is actually a actually being more becoming more and more prominent risk factor than we initially thought um, initially the the CDC um, had a, a, it, a classification where they put patients with a body mass index of about 40 at, at risk and now they brought that down that anybody with a body mass index of 30 or more is actually at higher risk so yes definitely risk factors plays a role um, the second part of the question with regards to immunity um, we we are fortunate that it seems we initially we weren't sure, but at the moment it seems that most people that gets infected with the virus do develop um, an immune response, and 
make it less likely to um, at least in the uh, in the first few months to get a to be reinfected mm-hmm. um, we are still not sure what will happen if the virus actually mutates like we see with a yearly influenza virus that you can get a, a, a this influenza on a yearly basis basically um, but in coronaviruses it seems if if we look at the literature that's starting to come out now that that that's not likely to be as big a problem as it is with the with the influenza virus yeah. so uh, hopefully we will have some form of longer term immunity um, once you've been effect- infected even if you had mild disease yeah and um, I don't know if you've been keeping up to to par with the, the the progress of a vaccine or whatever but if a vaccine is developed how how do you think it would reach us here in Africa or Namibia I mean you know, I, th- I think we, we, we're fortunate in that most of the, the um, sort of international community realizes this is a, a human, humanitarian crisis that we're sitting in. So even with, for instance, the, this new drug that is now available called Remdesivir, which was initially developed for Ebola, and then they realized, listen, this could work for, um, for coronavirus. Um, I mean, it's probably been approved in the United States, maybe say four months ago by a company that produces it in, in, in United States. And we are fortunate that they then, instead of holding onto the patent, gave it to some of the generic companies to make um, similar drugs or generic drugs to this um, for, for, for instance, Namibia, and, and we were able to get that. And I think the same will probably happen when we um, get to a vaccine. I'm very hopeful that we will get to a vaccine. It seems very likely. There's a few good candidates currently in phase three um, trials, which um, seem to be going well. And there's actually a few of the companies who started producing vaccines already in anticipation of them actually having an effective vaccine going through through the phase three trials. So if everything goes well, we might, if we're very lucky before the end of the year, but most probably early next year, yeah. sit with, a, with an effective vaccine. Yeah. Okay, doctor. That's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for your expertise and your help. We're glad that you are up and running again. You look so good. You look healthy. So we're glad. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know it was, it, I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add, end off with, anything like to say to the public? Yeah, you know, I think um, one, one, the, the important thing is that we, we now in, in the midst of it and we, we should ra- really try and just manage this, the, the, the epidemic at this stage. So each person should really try and protect themselves um, do the, um, social distancing, wash your hands very frequently, wear the masks when you're in public, avoid as much as possible contact with, with um, people outside of your, your family nucleus where, where you spend time with anyway, to just try and, and mitigate the, the effect. I mean, we know it's essentially, if we look at the, the rest of the world, we get a peak with, and it's, it's, I mean, within say a month or two, this, we will be over the worst of it. And it's just for this first, first few weeks, say six weeks or whatever we've, we've got left um, before we will see a downward trend. And we must just hang in there and try and stick to the rules. And that brings an end to this week's Heartbeat podcast. But what did you think about this topic? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below or give us a shout out on social media using the hashtag heartbeat. You're welcome to drop me an email. It's yokani at namibian.com.na. And remember, please wash your hands, social distance and wear your mask. From me, your host, Yokani, it's goodbye.